So I would like to introduce today our guest speaker, Professor Charles Haas. Charles is the LD Betts Professor of Environmental Engineering at Drexel University. He received his BS in Biology and MS in Environmental Engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology and his PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a member of the Board of Trustees of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. Uh, I do wanna throw in there that uh, you're, that the Academy does have student members and I am going to put in the chat uh, what is the the uh, web address to sign up for student membership in the academy. Uh, the topic of today's presentation is environmental pathogen engineering. So I will turn it over to Dr. Haas. Thank you, David. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I've actually had a long connection with the University of Miami. My very first master's student was a graduate of your BS program. I won't tell you what year, but a long time ago. Um, so I want to set forth this concept of environmental pathogen engineering as a, a peculiar uh, subspecialty of environmental engineering. And it has certain characteristics that I think are worthy of calling out and, and looking at. So I'll give you an introduction, talk about some of the key concepts of environmental engineering that we make use of to a large degree in environmental pathogen engineering, the unique aspects of pathogens, how we look at risk with an aim to control risk, case studies, and then some final comments at the end. So in terms of an introduction, let me first start with the definition of environmental engineering. And a few years ago, the National Academies did a, a report aimed at defining grand challenges for environmental engineering in this century. And I pulled out a quote on the left which is from their report, which is, is fascinating. Um, the discipline of environmental engineering has no single widely agreed upon definition. Now, <clears throat> I've adopted an operational definition on the right for environmental engineering, which is the design of systems, processes, and policies to reduce human impacts on the ecosystem and provide healthful air, water, and land for people and the ecosystem. <clears throat> with that, we can come up with an operational definition of environmental pathogen engineering. The same design, but it's to reduce human impact of pathogens on the ecosystem and to provide healthful with respect to pathogens, air, water, and land for people and the ecosystem. So our focus is on organisms that can cause disease to people. And why is this worthy of a peculiar um, distinction? And to me, one of the key differentiations of pathogens from other environmental contaminants is embodied in the slide. We ordinarily think about contaminants in the environment on a mass basis or a molar basis. When we deal with organisms, we think of them on a numeric basis. And for example, if I look at one organism as being of concern on the x-axis at the bottom, since one organism in principle is capable of causing illness in an exposed individual. If I divide by Avogadro's number, we can express that in molarity. And if you look at the upper x-axis, you see that expressed in moles. And we're down in the yoctomolar range, 
with one organism. And at least at this point, there are no chemical contaminants of interest that have been of concern down in the Yakta molar region. So on a molar basis, we're dealing with extremely small concentrations. Why is this of significance? Well, with all environmental contaminants, and we have variability and uncertainty associated with analytical methods, how we measure them. We have variability and uncertainty in terms of what happens intrinsically with processes that may remove or attenuate their presence. We have extrinsic variability in terms of sources of the contaminants, but at these low concentrations, we have stochastic variability, which relates to the fact that we're dealing with small numbers of particles and we have a Poisson distribution at best to contend with. And so the y-axis on this graph is the theoretical Poisson relative standard deviation, which is associated with small numbers of organisms, which can get large once you get below, let's say, 100 organisms to be interested in. So we're concerned about exposure to small numbers. This is much lower on a mole basis than chemical contaminants. And we have stochastic variability that superimposes itself on the problem. And so probabilistic thinking in dealing with pathogens becomes essential. The other differences are the amount exposed from the environment into a human or a non-human host can be amplified in vivo by multiplication within the host body itself in competition with the immune system so that we get to a, a large body burden. In fact, once we get to a large body burden for some pathogens, people can excrete or exhale pathogens back into the environment. And so in essence, people can both be receptors of the contaminant as well as sources of the contaminant for other people. Um, the microbiologists and the epidemiologists call that contagion. Adverse effects can result from a single exposure. And so short-term variability and short-term exposure can be important rather than relying on averaging to dampen out uh, variability that may occur. We have significant differences in host responses between individuals and between classes of individuals that may mitigate or exacerbate effects. And analytical methods historically have been more difficult and tedious, although once we've gone into molecular biological techniques, that becomes less the case, although it raises issues of their own, um, which I won't have time to get into here, but the tedium has been decreased by other peculiarities of dealing with uh, molecular analysis of pathogens in the environment. Now, we have three central paradigms in environmental engineering that I think transfer over very nicely into environmental pathogen engineering. These are the concepts of risk assessment, the source transfer, transport receptor paradigm for contaminants in the environment, and the design and reliability of interventions, particularly relying on a concept of multiple barriers. So let me talk about those in turn. So the risk assessment paradigm has been in play in environmental control and regulation really for well over 40 years. Risk analysis is a larger framework that embodies communication, risk management, economics, and social and policy factors. Within risk analysis is the risk assessment framework, which involves planning and scoping a study, hazard identification, hazard characterization, dose response, and exposure assessment, leading to a risk characterization. The elements of the risk assessment framework apply 
equally well to pathogens as they do the chemical and physical contaminants in the environment. In a generic approach, we can look at transformations between components in the environment, whether they be air, soil, root zones, vado zones, plants, surface water, sediment. Since I'm talking to Miami, I can talk about ocean and sand transport and interchange as other compartments to be of concern by. We have exposure media where people can be exposed to contamination in a variety of mechanisms, whether it be the water environment, the food environment, by animal contact, by dust, by inhalation, by soil, and so forth. And the ultimate routes of um, entry into a host could be by inhalation, by ingestion, by dermal contact, and so forth. And even with the, within the inhalation route, there are variations with the types of inhaled particles that may arise uh, producing an exposure. With all contaminants in the environment, we need to worry about what are the sources of contamination, what are their strength, what's the duration of their occurrence, what's their frequency, whether it by, for example, a sneeze in the case of an aerosol or um, human and agricultural contamination in the watershed. How does, it, how does it get transported? We have transport mechanisms, whether they be by Gaussian plume mechanisms in the outdoor air, by um, water attenuation in the flowing water environment, or by circulation within room air in the indoor air environment. How does it get attenuated or amplified? The bottom graphs on the slide, um, I know the print is small, but every contaminant in the environment can have a decay coefficient. And the data on the bottom represent early measurements of the decay coefficient of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on various surfaces indoors to indicate that you could get decay in surfaces, decay in air, decay in water, decay in soil, or any environment that pathogens find themselves on. Now, if exposure or risk is unacceptable, how do we intervene? And a very, very widely used term, and its first use in environmental engineering that I've been able to trace is 1970, in water, we're used to the concept of multiple barriers. We have multiple treatment steps, for example, in drinking water. And this was a study that I did with Rhodes Trestle back in the 90s when there was initial growing concern about the use of wastewater as a supply for drinking water. And a series of treatment steps has always been thought to be necessary to provide adequate control of microbial risks that may arise. In this case, we did analysis with virus and Giardia and Cryptosporidium, looking at a couple of different treatment sequences and showing that none of them by themselves were sufficient to reduce the risk to an acceptable value. But when taken together, either sequence one or sequence two could be acceptable. And in fact, we use as a metric of resilience um, using one calculation method, whether or not if I take out the most effective barrier, I still have adequate removal to maintain desirable quality, even if that one barrier completely fails. And both sequence one and sequence two were found to do that in this particular analysis. Now, Another way of looking at multiple barriers, which has become common in the age of COVID, is you may have seen variations of this, what's called the Swiss cheese model, where the idea is that if you look at what it takes for people to be successfully exposed to SARS-CoV-2, 
it needs to be failure of one or more of these barriers that are in place between the source of the virus on the left and the receptor individual on the right, which include personal responsibility, things like vaccination, um, staying home when you're sick, masking and so forth, and more government and institutional factors like vaccination, adequate ventilation, um, quarantine, isolation, and so forth. And the interesting aspect of this figure, which was put together by Ian Mackay at um, University of Queensland in Australia, you notice those little mice at the bottom where there's, where there's disinformation that acts against the sufficient pract practice of some of those barriers by individuals or by institutions. So the point is no single barrier, no single layer of the Swiss cheese can be sufficient in and of themselves. But when you put together enough layers that act differently, you notice in this particular framework, the holes of the Swiss cheese slices don't line up. You can get sufficient attenuation of the risk to give adequate protection above public health. And when it's multiple barriers fail or multiple slices of the Swiss cheese deform, that you get adverse impacts and ultimately an outbreak. We can express this probabilistic, probabilistically as well. This was a, um, a slide from that paper with Rhodes Trussell that I presented earlier in a more mathematical context. We can look at transformation probabilities between individual barriers, individual steps in our treatment train or individual slices of Swiss cheese. And by putting probability distributions, each one of those processes, we can assess the likelihood of the overall system failing. Now there's more unique features of pathogens I wanna uh, focus in on. One is that clearly in the environment, certain pathogens can amplify. Now, there's no evidence that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can amplify or grow in the environment, but for bacteria in particular and protozoa, there's a lot of evidence that bacteria or protozoa can amplify in the water system and in fact, in wetted environments in general. And Nikki Eschbalt, who's now in Australia, did a nice review in 2015, looking at the ecology of classes of organisms that he calls saprozoic pathogens, primarily bacteria, such as Legionella and Mycobacterium, which can persist and amplify within biofilms in the wetted environment, often interacting with protozoa to help them amplify and persist, and how widely, how many bacterial um, genera can undertake the saprozoic existence in the water environment, I think is an open question that well merits a lot of additional study. Clearly Legionella can, clearly Mycobacteria can, there's a lot of evidence the Campylobacter can, what else can as well? I just um, put this slide in because there's an entire class of organisms that we still have not studied sufficiently with respect to environmental exposure, and those are fungal diseases. Um, there's an estimate there are 1.6 million deaths worldwide due to exposure to fungi. Much of that exposure may be environmentally associated. Um, Candida, for example, being one, and there are many other fungal diseases of importance. This review article from 2019 is a nice entree into that literature. I have a current PhD student I'm advising at Drexel who's trying to get his hands on how do we do risk assessment of environmental exposure to fungi in different contexts. So stay tuned. But fungi can be important both in air and water and in uh, contact exposure as well. <clears throat> now, 
as I indicated, people can be sources. And to some degree, we're used to that in the water environment because we know that people infected by gastrointestinal pathogens can have those pathogens amplify. They can excrete the pathogens back to the water in their feces, which can contaminate um, either their hands or fluids in the environment or agricultural fields or parts of their living space. There can be direct or indirect contamination of food and future uh, victims can be exposed if sanitation is inadequate. Same thing can occur in air. In air, we can have an individual who's infected. And we know that for many organisms, including SARS-CoV-2, the individuals can expire infectious particles into the airborne environment, which may deposit on surfaces, resulting in fomites and the second individual by contact of the surface may become infected. They can excrete, they can expire large particles into the ear, um, which have often historically been called droplets that can directly land on mucous surfaces, or they can exhale smaller particles, which can persist in the indoor environment, being conveyed with air currents in a room and get inhaled into the respiratory system of a susceptible individual to cause more cases. It's well known that this aerosol release can occur. This was a study done um, early in the SARS outbreak, simply indicating by ordinary breathing, people can breathe respiratory liquids into a room environment. It's known now that this can be a various particle sizes, which can include directly inhaled uh, respirable particles as well as droplets. It's been known now that SARS-CoV-2 can be in those uh, particles. This was a study pre-coronavirus done with um, influenza virus to indicate that even without coughing, as well as with coughing, both fine, fine aerosols as well as coarse aerosols can be emitted by infected volunteers at a fairly high number concentration. This work has now been duplicated by several authors with SARS-CoV-2. So it's known that the exhalation of coronavirus can occur. And in fact, it's likely that many of the clusters that have occurred of indoor coronavirus, for example, in restaurants, there are some aircraft cases and so forth, and where uh, people have been in close contact have occurred by inhalation of the aerosol. And early on, this was a nice review by Kim Prather from UCSD and colleagues pointing out the importance of the aerosol indoor route in SARS-CoV-2. I think this is now widely recognized in most circles, although World Health Organization has been slow to the act in terms of understanding the implications for this. Once we have aerosols released into the environment, we can describe their transport by well-known theory. This was a study that a former student of mine, um, Simi Hawk, who's now at University of South Carolina, did showing with bioaerosols that you can describe their fate and transport by computational fluid dynamics. You can look at statistical distributions in these box models and get heterogeneity that could be coupled into a risk assessment. How do you assess the risk once you've estimated the exposure? To assess risk, we need a dose response model. And there has been an evolution in dose response modeling of infectious organisms. I did a review article in 2015 on this in ES&T. In the early days, and regrettably in some current literature, 
There are people who still talk about minimal infectious dose. It's wrong. There is no such thing. One infectious particle has the possibility to cause an adverse effect. It won't necessarily do to attenuation by the immune system within the host, but it has that possibility. And so to model this, the simplest class of models that we can use are to model the probability that one organism may survive to initiate an adverse effect. This gives us an exponential or beta Poisson dose response curve in the indoor air quality literature. There's a parallel development that has led to something called the Wells-Riley model, which is functionally equivalent to the exponential dose response model. We can also, in second generation models, talk about how we modify that to take into account known or estimated impacts of host or dose variability. Third generation models, we can incorporate incubation time to look not simply at likelihood of an adverse effect, but the time distribution of adverse effects. And beyond that, we can start to incorporate finer details of individual host responses. And so let me give you a brief flavor of some of those classes of models. Now, and this is one of the early exponential models that I developed, which is for cryptosporidium. This was based on a deliberate human feeding trials of cryptosporidium in volunteers on the left. We also did some work using a uh, looking at analysis of um, uh, human feeding trials for rotavirus that was done at University of Cincinnati. The cryptosporidium data on the left, it's an exponential model where D is the average dose to a population. And the beta Poisson um, model fit the rotavirus on the right uh, with the functional form at the bottom. In all cases, the average the metric is the average dose. In all cases with exponential and beta Poisson, both of those models predict that at low dose, there's a linear relationship between dose and the probability of the adverse event. And then finally, in all three of those models, there is no threshold. There is no dose at which the precise risk is equal to zero. Although on the right-hand graph, because of the way in which the data has been plotted with a linear Y scale, it would appear that the dose response goes to zero. In fact, it doesn't. And if I expanded that plot using a logarithmic Y axis, you would see that the dose response curve goes down uh, logarithmically rather than all the way down to zero. We can translate this into a concept of how clean is clean. If we decide on what an acceptable annual risk is and what that number should be is a social and risk management construct rather than solely an engineering or scientific construct, we can use dose response models to come up with an acceptable concentration and an acceptable level of treatment. On the left-hand side, the left-hand graph, in fact, underlies how the drinking water standards for cryptosporidium were devised, although EPA um, has tried to back away from the idea that they were derived from an acceptable risk level, but in fact, implicitly they were. Depending on the influent, if you use a one in 10,000 annual risk level, then the line indicates with uncertainty bounds to it, how much of a log reduction you would need to get to an acceptable level of risk. Now with SARS-CoV-2, we developed a similar set of plots and 
Um, this was published, and I'll give you the reference in a second, uh, in risk analysis into, first of all, we have a dose response curve for what may be an analog to SARS-CoV-2, human coronavirus 229E, which was tested in humans. And based on that human dose response curve, we came up with the bottom graph where if we have an average inhaled dose in an exposure scenario and the number of people that might be exposed, then we have a line that tells us what average inhaled dose would be necessary to get less than one case in that population that you might see. And you can translate that into room air quality standards. Now, we've in fact uh, validated this. The second reference here, the first order is Parzikar, um, who is now a postdoc at, at Harvard. He did his PhD at University of Oregon with uh, Kevin Vind and Weilenberg, um, validated these dose response models against some of the early outbreak uh, studies for SARS-CoV-2. And it looks like it's getting reasonable approaches. The original uh, set of curves that I just showed you was published in 2021 in risk analysis. Now we can look at what the immune processes within people might do to modify dose response. And EPA in the early 2000s came up with the idea of a key events dose response framework to look at interactions with the immune system, uh, modification by absorption, in vivo multiplication, and so forth. The focus of the Julian et al. 2009 paper was chemicals. We can do the same thing for microorganisms. First of all, we can look at incubation time and growth. And a former PhD student of mine, Wang et al., who's now at FDA, looked at developing dose response time models for pathogens. This is for inhalation of Ricinia pestis and mice. The individual uh, data points and curves represent different incubation times after a time zero inoculation. Obviously, the incubation time shifts from uh, left to right. Excuse me, right to left, you get a higher um, potency. And we were able to model this by a class of new models that uh, Wang developed to Yersinia and to a variety of other pathogens as well. We can couple incubation time with epidemiological models. Uh, Vidya Prasad worked on this for a variety of waterborne and foodborne outbreaks. Uh, Joe Eisenberg at University of Michigan has developed some uh, epidemiological disease transmission models. And you notice that square box in the middle that he called latently, latently infected. That corresponds to the incubation time of the pathogen after exposure before you start to get either asymptomatic or symptomatic infection. That corresponds to an incubation time, which we can generate either from deliberate feeding trials or by retrospective analysis, as Vidya did on the left-hand curve from an outbreak that has occurred. Now, as I indicated earlier on, we're moving to molecular methods for analysis of pathogens. The molecular methods field is a rapidly moving field. It's very powerful, but it brings in a set of assumptions and limitations on its own. There's no method that's perfect. Culture-based methods have their limitations, particularly with respect to having to know what you're looking for before you find it. However, molecular methods, whether it's digital PCR or amplicon sequencing or metagenomic sequencing, uh, 
have their limitations as well. And those are either with respect to knowing what pathogens are present or knowing whether or not the pathogens may be infectious. So my argument here is generally it helps to use multiple methods and we need to work on finding ways for the best fusion of data from multiple sources into information on human health risk. Let me finish off with some case studies, primarily for the students that um, might be interested in particular topics as entree into the literature. So I spent a lot of time looking at the issue of wastewater reuse, particularly for uh, potable reuse. And this is of uh, a major concern in the arid regions of the country. Although I think, um, David, you may know the more updated data on this. I think there still is a reuse facility in St. Pete um, that has been at least at a pilot schedule, a stick scale, if not full implementation. But a reuse from wastewater is important in water short regions and reliability for pathogen removal is a key concern. There have been large pilot studies conducted in the West Coast. This is from a 1MGD pilot study that was done um, and has been ongoing in San Diego, looking at reliability for virus, cryptosporidium, and giardia removal, and how do you synthesize estimates for multiple processes from pilot to full scale. And the state of California is starting to use this information to develop criteria or reuse standards in California. How can we develop criteria for indoor exposure? Kerry Hamilton, a former student of mine, now at Arizona State, looked at risk assessment approaches versus um, for potential sources of infectious aerosols in the indoor environment, in this case for Legionella and came up with water-based criteria for Legionella if the exposure is by route to faucets, toilets, showers, and so forth. And could this be used to develop actionable criteria at the point of entry of water into a home? Going back to SARS for a moment, one of the early issues, which you may remember with SARS, is whether or not we had to worry about disinfecting all surfaces or whether or not the aerosol route was the one to focus on. This was a very nicely done study by Patol and Julian out of Switzerland, looking at the risk associated with exposure, in this case, to single touch by surfaces. And they concluded in this study, which was published in the ESNT letters, that the risk from hand exposure to surfaces, which is called the fomite route, fomite route was minimal. And therefore, the initial focus on surface decontamination for reduction of the risk for SARS-CoV-2 was a bit of a misplaced investment. Now, having said that, there are other pathogens where the surface risk may be important. The reason one of concern is monkeypox. Monkeypox, or now called mpox, clearly has a dominant fomite risk of transmission in addition to person-to-person -to -person direct touch. But not everything is fomites. And for some, such as SARS-CoV-2, the inhalation and aerosol route is most important. And so with this, hopefully since this is the graduate seminar, I've, um, I've had the students realize that a lot of what you know from other aspects of environmental engineering could be applied to environmental pathogen engineering. We need to incorporate information from molecular biology, occupational hygiene, medicine into our toolkits along with what generally environmental engineers use from public health and exposure sciences.
There's a lot of opportunity for innovation in measurement, modeling, and synthesis. New venues, new problems, new pathogens will drive innovation as they have with SARS-CoV-2. Engineers, though, can bring the unique mindset of engineering, quantitative analysis, and solution of problems by decomposition to the table and should not be afraid to do so. And my mantra for the past three years is protection of public health is too important to just be limited to physicians. So go bold into the field. A lot of um, former students, some of whom I mentioned, a lot of colleagues and current collaborators at Drexel and elsewhere, and funding and professional organizations and associations that have helped me along the way. So with that, David, I will unshare the screen and welcome any questions.